let's begin. Uh, today we're going to start our discussion of Indigenous women, and we're going to be dealing with issues of uh, violence against Indigenous women and uh, personal property on reserve. Next class, we'll be taking up the issue of um, membership and Aboriginal women and loss of status, regaining of status, residual discrimination that's still present as a result of those Indian Act regimes. We do have a makeup class on Friday where we're going to be talking about the first lecture dealing with uh, child welfare. And so I encourage you to make the time for that uh, as we did before. Um, where we are now in the course is, that it is at an important transition point. Um, we've been obviously focusing on both the external and internal dynamics of Indigenous people's relationship to the state through the entire course, but a lot of our focus has been on the federal and provincial governments and uh, what they've done to uh, make it more difficult for Indigenous peoples to organize themselves and carry forward with their laws. Um, now, um, we'll be looking at a greater focus on the internal dimensions of Indigenous communities over the next few weeks. Um, it is the case that you'll still see a lot of external legislation and cases that impact on First Nations. It's just as a matter of emphasis, we're having a bit of a transition here. And uh, that's going to be picked up with these issues of Indigenous women, uh, child welfare, and criminal justice. Um, in terms of the uh, sort of purpose of these uh, lectures, then, it's to have you appreciate the complex nature of the way that law operates uh, both within and uh, outside of these communities. Um, so uh, today, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about these two topics, uh, violence against uh, violence and Indigenous women, and then matrimonial property on reserve. When we talk about uh, the first issue in terms of violence, we're going to be looking at the statistical context and also the historical and social context. So we're going to try to fill in some background around those uh, pieces. And then finally, looking at matrimonial property on reserve as the second component, we're going to address the Derrickson case coming out of the Supreme Court of Canada in the 1980s, mid-1980s, um, from the West Bank First Nation. And then we're going to look at a most recent legislative response issued by Parliament in 2013, the matrimonial property uh, legislation that applies on reserves. That's not in the materials because that uh, happened after the casebook was edited. And then finally, we'll look at some comparative perspectives. And so that's how it's going to break down in terms of our uh, conversations today, looking more generally at violence and then looking at another kind of violence, dealing with property on reserves. So first of all, with regard to the statistical context, I encourage you, if you've got time, to watch this six-minute uh, clip. It does give a sense of the overview of how First Nations are faring in this country, uh, socioeconomically, their demographics. A little bit here, um, First Nations women, or actually Indigenous women more generally, are 3.5 times more likely to experience violence than non-Aboriginal women. Um, they're three times more likely to experience spousal assault than non-Aboriginal women. 54% uh, of Aboriginal women report severe family violence uh, versus 37% of non-Aboriginal women. 27% uh, of uh, Aboriginal women experience 10 or more assaults by the same offender versus 18% of non-Aboriginal women. Um, there's over 1,181 uh, missing and murdered women in uh, Canada. Um, and Indigenous women are five times more likely to be killed or disappear um, as a result of these statistics. Um, Indigenous women make up uh, about over 30% of all uh, federally incarcerated uh, women. And then uh, provincial incar incarceration, which is less than two years, uh, you see 87% in Saskatchewan, 
83% in Manitoba, 54% in Alberta, 29% uh, in British Columbia, way beyond their representation in the population, uh, which may be about 5% of the population, which is 87% of people incarcerated, and you recognize maybe in Saskatchewan they're 11%. Um, there's a significant challenge here. Indigenous women earn $5,000 a year less than non-Aboriginal women, and their employment uh, rate, um, unemployment rate, is a 17%. Um, and generally, it's about 6 or 7% for um, non-Aboriginal women. Uh, in terms of education, they also have much lower rates of um, attainment of both post-secondary and secondary education. And again, this clip will give you a, a much better context of that if you're able to watch that uh, at another time. This seems very dry on the page like this. Um, it's hard to appreciate the staggering impact of this kind of um, what's represented by these numbers in terms of uh, people's lives. And I was talking to my mother and sister last night, they would just tell me story after story of uh, the kinds of challenges that they face. My sister I mentioned to you works with uh, family crisis uh, centers and works uh, dealing with uh, abuse uh, around um, women and children. And uh, you know, just it's just a, a really difficult thing to be able to uh, communicate without living through or being a part of some of these communities, but I hope this at least gives you a sense, uh, given the, the large numbers that are there, and the materials try to convey some of this as well. Historical context, uh, this Manitoba Justice Inquiry is, uh, is now quite old, but uh, you, there's been updates of this inquiry, and it still is very relevant in terms of what it's portraying. You find within traditional society, there was a sense of indigenous women being empowered, certainly relative to as they are now. Um, now we have to be careful about the romanticization and pretending that everything was just amazing in the past, but certainly the situation in the past seems to be uh, better than we currently uh, experience. Um, indigenous women did have a central role within many of these communities where their autonomy um, was vital to the functioning of the community. They often had their own economic sphere that they could control, um, either um, dealing with uh, an economic space like um, in my area, garden plots. Um, in the Haudenosaunee, they actually owned the houses and the garden plots as well. Uh, with the Haudenosaunee, they also were the governing authority in terms of being able to uh, put into power um, often male chiefs, but take out of power male chiefs if they, if they didn't accord with the wishes of the clan mothers. Up and down the coast here, you often find these matriarchal, matrilocal societies with significant authority, responsibility, economic power being there within these uh, matrilineal communities. Often, this was reinforced by many of the creation stories which would place women as quite central in their um, genesis and in the way that sociality was expected to unfold. So you remember I've talked about Sky Woman from time to time, both as an Iroquois and a, a Mishnabe um, creation uh, ideal. And so within the communities, there were models to look to as powerful women who kind of set things in motion and as a part of that power, that kind of modeling would help people to recognize that again, women could have that power in contemporary <coughs> circumstances and that there would be consequences for um, turning aside that power. Um, the earth itself is often considered women as a woman in many places, Mother Earth, and uh, there's the ceremonial components of that help to reinforce the need for understanding uh, respect, creating spheres of autonomy, creating this idea of uh, balance 
uh, one of the teachings I heard quite strongly on the prairies when I was working with the elders in Saskatchewan was the notion of um, a man and women being like two sides of an eagle's uh, wings. You need both of those wings in order to be able to soar, and they would often talk about uh, relationships uh, between the sexes in that fashion, uh, needing both there to create a lift in the society. Um, this emphasis on equality or more regularly balance or harmony um, was something that uh, authors have tried to um, recognize, uh, put out there, um, and, and, and try to find ways to create a reconnection to in order to facilitate a resurgence of, a reinvigoration of uh, Indigenous societies, Indigenous uh, women's roles within those societies. So the last set of slides around the terrible situation that Indigenous women find themselves in today is quite in contrast with uh, some of the um, ways that women experience life and or women are now reflecting on back at what those lives were um, prior to the arrival of Europeans and after, even after Europeans arrived. When um, Jesuits and others would observe these societies, um, they were often quite critical of African societies because of the role that women took. This was regarded as being contrary to the natural order of things in a Victorian worldview. And so uh, one of the reasons that African people were often considered inferior and savage, in quotations, is because of this sense of women having this role and this wasn't in accordance with natural law, natural justice, as viewed in Victorian uh, circles. Now again, we need to be careful not to overemphasize this and romanticize this. It is true by way of emphasis that you'll find a lot of guidance there, but there certainly was violence in these communities. They certainly weren't um, a utopia. Maybe I'm just naive, but it seems a little curious that the, the Victorians who are named for Queen Victoria would be so you know, anti-woman-led society. That's right. There's a place right where the queen is actually the leader of society, and yet women are being treated so uh, poorly as property of men, basically, in uh, England. So there's something quite amiss there, even in that uh, moment, where that model just didn't seem to take hold more generally. So this idea then of Indigenous women having a place uh, can be a, a, a way of thinking about resurgence of Indigenous law around dealing with violence, around dealing with uh, matrimonial property, but we could go off the rails with that too. And if we just think that everything in the past is glorious, um, it cuts us off from learning about our own faults and failures and seeing us as a part of humankind, that as a part of humankind are as flawed as other people are on Earth, as, as well as being as beautiful as other people are on Earth. And I think I mentioned before in one of the articles that Emily Snyder, Val Napoleon, and I had just written with the University of British Columbia Law Journal, we've taken some of those old stories that contain legal principles in them and shown that within these stories are quite um, troubling accounts of violence against Aboriginal women prior to the arrival of Europeans and yet, the recording of those stories and the way that those stories unfold give some guidance about principles in terms of how um, those societies dealt with that violence and uh, those kinds of things might stand as a resource for reasoning today in, uh, again, reinvigorating Indigenous people's laws. But not only that, right? There's so much that we can learn in the present day uh, that can uh, help us uh, through that path of trying to deal with that real challenge and problem. So that's the traditional sense. Uh, let's keep it complicated. Let's not just put it all on one axis of a glorious past. But nevertheless, there was a colonial change that did uh, create uh, quite a negative impact for many communities. First of all, you're told about the law itself uh, in this period as Victorians introduced it. Um, men were considered social, legal, and political masters at the time they were encountering indigenous peoples 
Men in Europe uh, regarded women as only having rights as derived through their husbands. Um, the laws of England held that women did not have the right to vote, to own property, or enter into contracts. Um, these ideas were bas basically um, seeded into the Indian Act in 1876. Um, yeah, that's the date. When the Indian Act was passed, that's what the law did in terms of non-Aboriginal women. So the Indian Act did things like try to dispossess women from holding land, trying to dispossess women from being able to take uh, political office, try to dispossess women from being able to have a sphere of autonomy. The idea was to create a domestic sphere for Aboriginal women that would be subservient to Aboriginal men within those economies. Residential schools um, were a big part of reinforcing what was embedded in statute as uh, young people were removed from their communities where they had models of, of kind of harmony and gender equality and uh, women were um, taught how to sew and cook and uh, clean within the residential schools and men were out in the barns uh, with the animals or chopping wood or learning a trade. And uh, this kind of uh, manipulation, social engineering of their economic circumstances when people came out of residential schools um, was um, part of that Indian Act uh, process. You also, in addition to the law, creating a domestic sphere, both through statute and regulation with residential school, you have images of Aboriginal women that are often not very flattering that uh, creep into this uh, period. Women, Indigenous women, as this idea of, uh, of drudge, uh, kind of just bearing the weight of their community. The Emma LaRock on page 790 uh, talks about this idea of a dehumanized uh, a woman, um, the, um, the derogatory naming of women in terms of uh, squaw, uh, just a terrible term, um, but the ideas that get reinforced around lustful and immoral and uh, unfeeling, uh, dirty, were some of the images that uh, were circulating in the media. Um, uh, if you look at the newspapers at the time, when the films start coming in in the 1920s, you get this picked up, the stories that are told in the popular press. Always had these Indian women jumping off cliffs because somehow they couldn't live without their male partners um, suddenly being away or rejecting them. This idea of women as having no sense. So you've got all sorts of rocks around Canada called Princess Rock or whatever, where there's these sites of uh, labeling women after the squaw lakes, etc. So there's something about the images in this time that reinforce what the law, what residential schools are also putting forward. This, of course, if it's lived long enough with through uh, generations, you're a five-year-old, you go to residential school, you come back from residential school as a teenager, and you see that the men are the ones that are being lifted up by the agents and the women are being left aside. There leads to a process of internalization after a time. People, indigenous women themselves and men themselves start to believe what it is that they're taught as they're part of um, um, these legal institutions otherwise. Um, this internalization is, um, is something that creates a kind of an indifference uh, within the community, but of course outside the community it also tends to create an indifference uh, when uh, Aboriginal women come forward, Indigenous women come forward and try to deal with the challenges uh, that they have. Um, you know, we'll talk about this next class, Aboriginal women lost status in great numbers as a result of the Indian Act. If an Indian woman married a non-Indian man, uh, she would lose her status. If an Indian man married a non-Indian woman, that non-Indian woman would gain status. 
And so there was this stripping out of uh, women from communities and, uh, and, and treating Indian men, uh, and, and brothers and sisters being treated unequally, differently, as a result of uh, this period. We're gonna look at property in a second and see the, the, the damage that's uh, uh, inflicted on that. And then the right to vote, uh, the right to participate in political processes was also discouraged. You know, the Indian Acts um, had these Indian agents that were over the band council up until the late 1960s, and the Indian agents would often discourage Indian women um, from voting in these uh, elections for, for band councils, and of course, in those band councils, it would set the rules around property, etc. So this, um, you know, um, Social change um, led to huge uh, challenges, and as they then um, sort of deal with the effects of this, uh, violence often sets in. When someone is subordinate, it becomes much easier to justify uh, treating them uh, with harshness, uh, with uh, violence, and again, the response is different. And so you look at uh, these materials, and you see um, there's kind of an epidemic of, of violence in communities. The way that non-Aboriginal service providers have dealt with uh, Indigenous communities has been terrible. Uh, there's been an unsympathetic uh, uh, treatment uh, by those who are supposedly there to help. Um, the social work profession, the uh, police uh, have often uh, not responded. Um, an abused uh, person uh, usually takes about 20 times experiencing abuse before they seek help. And then when they go to the police and the, the police discourage them from seeking help or don't uh, take uh, seriously um, what, sets, uh, what sets in, that obviously undermines the confidence that Indigenous women uh, would have in the justice uh, system. Um, you might have heard recently out of Quebec um, there's uh, been all those allegations of the police um, sexually assaulting themselves, uh, Aboriginal uh, women uh, in those communities. So just terrible that that would happen. And unfortunately, that's not always isolated. So when the police get involved, it often leaves Indigenous women in a worse position than they were in uh, uh, prior to that point given the 20 times of abuse that they might have experienced. And then they get before the justice system, and there's often an indifference by lawyers or an arrogance by lawyers and judges. Of course, you know there's long response times in the systems. Um, so there's those issues that are present. And then often in the communities, there's adequate, inadequate safe houses for Indigenous women that have experienced um, these kinds of uh, uh, behaviors and the often male dominated um, political cultures uh, don't themselves take this seriously enough. So it's not just that externally you get all these challenges, internally challenges arrive. And I, I really think it's important to quote from the justice uh, report here for Manitoba on page 793. It's the second paragraph from the bottom where this uh, Justice Sinclair, who was the person that ran the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and Justice Hamilton drew this conclusion after having um, um, sessions all over the province meeting in urban and rural communities with Indigenous uh, and non-Indigenous peoples. Quote, the unwillingness of chiefs and councils to address the plight of women and children suffering abuse at the hands of husbands and fathers is quite alarming. We are concerned enough about it to state that we believe that the failure of Aboriginal governmental leaders to deal with the problems of domestic abuse is unconscionable. We believe that there is a heavy responsibility on Aboriginal leaders to recognize the significance of the problem within their communities. We, they must begin to recognize as well how much their silence and failure actually contribute to this process. <coughs> Aboriginal leaders must speak out against the abuse within their communities to their own community members, and they must take steps within their own spheres of community influence 
to assist um, these uh, uh, victims. So I really want to embrace that myself in my own life as a male who teaches in this field and acts in this field. But I also am uh, glad to see that over the past five or so years, there's been an increasing uh, stepping forward by not just uh, uh, Indigenous women who have long been raising this issue, but Indigenous men, um, this uh, um, uh, moose hide uh, project that uh, we were introduced to earlier is one of those things. Uh, Chief Atlio, when he was with the uh, Assembly of First Nations, certainly made this one of his uh, priorities to speak out about it uh, quite uh, prominently. I know Chief Elgard is in the same uh, category. Um, so it's not just something that's external. We can't just blame colonialism, residential schools, police, lawyers, though we can blame them, but it's not the only ones to blame, right? There's a, a need to look internally as well and as we do so keep things in perspective uh, recognize that it's complex there too not just tar everyone with that brush uh, there are many people within communities both men and women that are also trying to uh, make a difference on this front despite um, that uh, problem that still exists of male dominance in uh, many of the indigenous uh, political structures not in all cases but in too many so let's just put this last slide on before I invite questions, which is to make the point that to the kind of violence that we're talking about can be physical, it can be sexual, it can also be psychological, uh, it can be visited on uh, any partner by any other partner, uh, but it's disproportionately experienced by female partners. And it's difficult to fully comprehend the impact of this violence if not experienced directly or even indirectly. Sometimes the indirect experience of violence can be just as uh, damaging depending on a person's uh, makeup and their subsequent support. And studying this idea can itself be disturbing and painful. So when we discuss this issue, when you're receiving clients or you're in other classes, uh, please keep in mind that it's statistically probable that some of your classmates will have experienced violence in their intimate relationships uh, when you're in your firms, uh, when you're uh, uh, counseling uh, with people that come to you for advice in the future. Your experience or your non-experience will affect how you perceive and react to so-called uh, domestic uh, violence. Um, so I've gone through then a few slides here of the statistical context of violence against women, the historical context, and the social context of uh, this violence to give you a picture of how women, indigenous women are often doubly disadvantaged. Not only do they have to deal with colonialism, but then also have to deal with the sexism that's associated with uh, colonialism. And it's not as if those two things are separate and in silos. They intersect with one another in quite complicated ways. And you can't just uh, strip one out and say, well, I'm just gonna deal with the sexual, the sex discrimination I face and just think that that's aside from the colonial discrimination. They're both joined in uh, that fashion. And we see that the law is at the heart of much of what is being experienced here through the way the Indian Act was crafted, through the way the regulations set up the schooling structures and what was taught there, and then how uh, Indigenous women are being treated when they try to come forward and deal with this, both with the police, with the lawyers, and then with their own uh, people in their own uh, communities. So I might just, with that uh, caveat, background invite, any comments that you might have in thinking about uh, this picture here in understanding something that is going to now lead to an inquiry. Uh, the, the Liberal government has promised that there's going to be an inquiry on uh, murdered and missing women, and right now I think it's Carolyn Bennett 
who's the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, is doing some pre-consultation uh, work. And on December 6th, it's uh, a target for an announcement about how this uh, commission uh, might uh, run. Um, one of the things that is on um, the debating table right now is how wide to scope out the um, inquiry. Um, Wally Opal, who ran a missing and murdered women inquiry of sorts here in British Columbia, had a very narrow scope for what they could examine in terms of uh, looking at this issue. He thought that was a good thing, and he is continued to give advice to the government that there should be a narrower scoping. Um, others are saying that was a problem to have such a narrow scope because you couldn't actually get at the, the social, um, <coughs> historical, colonial issues. You might remember Stephen Harper said when asked about a murdered and missing woman in inquiry, he said, it, to tell the truth, it's not actually that uh, high on my radar. Uh, so there's different points of view about whether or not this inquiry should even go forward, but if it should go forward, what kind of scoping it might have. Questions, comments, observations there, if you follow the news at all. There's a lot of crap here. Okay. That's right. Okay. I have a question. Yes. In the article you wrote with Brown, when we did you cover facts and when you put the same information with Brown potentially, or are there some things in addition to the principles that you hadn't seen? Yeah, in fact, uh, the principles themselves within the stories do talk about solutions to dealing with violence against uh, indigenous women, which is often uh, about triangulation or checks and balances or having a diffusion of authority, making sure that um, um, you don't just put all your eggs in one basket in terms of dealing with a problem. So that in answer to this problem, it's not just, well, let's just you know give everyone self-government and you know empower native women. That's not the exclusive thing to do, although that might be a part of the answer. Nor is the answer, let's just treat this as a criminal law issue and put everything into um, you know, making sure that we get better services for police, lawyers, uh, uh, justice uh, system officials. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a bit of all of it, uh, and recognizing that it's a multi-pronged, multi-approach, multi-faceted solution that's required. It's, diversifying our portfolio of options or having a greater repertoire uh, at our disposal to deal with this. Um, question. Uh, the, the piece that you wrote with the Lena Pullian, um, is it in publication? It's in publication, and so it's actually in the library on the shelves there in 2015, UBC Law Journal. You can also just find it online at UBC Law Journal's website and read it uh, through the, the library here. I'm sorry, I missed, I missed the name. 2015, University of British Columbia Law Journal. The name of the article? Oh, what is, I'm not sure what it's called. But <laughs> it would be Val Napoleon, Emily Snyder, and myself as the authors. And the other day you spoke about, or you mentioned to me, um, another thing that Val Napoleon wrote on mortgages. Yes, so Val Napoleon is working on this issue from not only the violence against women perspective, but also the indigenous women and property perspective. And she's written an article about uh, matrimonial property, uh, mortgages, uh, dealing with uh, the Simpson people. I'll have to, I, I'm not sure if that's actually published that second. Year. We tried to go on the internet the other day and we couldn't find it. Okay. So, Lindsay just asked me a question a moment ago about other things that we learned. Um, generalizations are suspect. That is, eggs in one basket solutions can be problematic. This is just not an ideological issue that you can solve by having a liberal or conservative approach to the world. It, it just cuts across so many different lines that don't allow it to be dealt with in that way. Again, the generalization of the past was amazing, let's just replicate the past, is also suspect. Uh, also, it's important to recognize that Indigenous women are experts in this area and draw upon their knowledge, their experience, in trying to come to some solutions to this issue. And that's not what we were seeing in uh, prior approaches 
when the, the different inquiries were launched in Saskatchewan and uh, here in British Columbia. Hopefully, if there's a national inquiry, there will be a national inquiry, that's a part of it. And this YouTube clip here um, draws out some of that experience. Um, a a community-based approaches are needed. Uh, so the idea is um, not just national, although national is important. Um, you need things happening in the reserve settings, the, the rural settings, as well as in the urban settings as well. Um, complexity must be incorporated. Um, we need to recognize that there's aspects of this that are unknowable. So there's advice that these women in this clip here give to lawyers and say, recognize you don't know everything. And when you have a client come to talk with you about this, um, uh, don't, don't just assume that you would rush to an answer there. Understand uh, negative experiences that Indigenous women have had with professionals and service providers. Um, you, know, you might be the best person in the world, have you received the best education, and be fully knowledgeable of this. But if you um, work with some of the people in this field, you're not going to be labeled as that best. That label is going to be you know what's happened the past 30 years. You're going to have an uphill trust issue to overcome in uh, dealing with uh, people that have experienced uh, this challenge in some cases. Relationality is often a key to understanding. Um, Justice Finch of the British Columbia Court of Appeal, you know, we talked about the duty to consult and accommodate. He's framed this as a duty to learn, uh, that the judiciary, uh, lawyers, uh, people involved in the legal system, working through this uh, uh, challenge, have a, have a duty that's like that duty to consult, duty to accommodate, a duty to learn about what's going on here. And then finally, to name uh, and recognize, and I said, I, I said deconstruct, it says destruct power, <laughs> deconstruct power. Uh, right, well, the point here is that we often miss uh, where people are holding power, like um, what was so important in that Manitoba Justice Inquiry, naming what those chiefs are doing from time to time that's wrong and deconstructing that. So there are things that can be learned in this social context that come from um, the experience of people working in the field that I hope and think will be a part of this inquiry, and that I don't know where the inquiry will go in terms of its uh, answers to questions. Other things? Yes. Um, I looked up the citation. It's gender and violence drawing on Indigenous legal resources, and it's Mary Ebert. Okay, gender and violence. I think, I think that's the one we're talking. So that's that's a, a prior um, talk we gave oh, about that, but it's there too. Yeah, Mary Ebert's our way. My apologies. That's fine. You, when you write, you always recycle. <laughs> that's the <laughs> great academic secret. <laughs> Yes. Um, uh, uh, Elaine Craig wrote a really nice article about um, a really powerful article about how the um, like complaint orders were a perpetuation of colonial power. Um, and it's so interesting because mm -hmm. I guess then she's also Boston. Um, but one of the things that that article still has me thinking about every year kind of touching on it on complex issue that has to be addressed by multiple sides. So how do non-Aboriginal groups um, assist or come into these communities and, and help in that way, knowing that there's there's probably going to be a lot of barriers put up for them in, in their willingness to allow more non-Aboriginal groups to come in when they've been so, they've just done such a poor job prior, and how to address that barrier and how to come to an understanding and, and have that occur mm -hmm. and just the difficulties yeah. around that because of like such a terrible terrible history um, and, and like I do not have an answer but it, mm -hmm. that's just a question like how do we even start that conversation yeah well one of the points um, is this last one here which is to recognize the power that lawyers have as you're working in that field 
and, uh, and try to find ways to um, yield some of that power to those that have that expertise, the, the women that uh, um, you know, have either experiences of working in the communities and then becoming allies in that with their leadership, uh, taking those steps in a, a supportive role, bringing the skills to bear um, that you have uh, and that you know, people that you uh, worked with would have. In that regard, this duty to learn is so important too, recognizing we don't have all the answers. As lawyers, we can't just go to the statute or the case and say, here's what you need to apply. You know, that's uh, maybe part of what you'll need to apply, but not the only thing that's there. Very often in, in residential communities, or in residential uh, res reserves, I can't even find the word this morning, I'm sorry. Um, there are, there's often a group of women who have spent their time um, because they've gone through things, they've spent their time healing themselves. They've gone through a process. They, they know that it's not right what's happening. And so they, they go out and they seek tools for themselves. And they're, they're amazing women who have, have stepped up and very often um, as volunteers um, help communities and can help lawyers understand that sometimes you can't you can't find the answer as a lawyer but these people as John said um, these these women are very knowledgeable and and it's there to assist you and I know in our community we have a healing house it's not and we have a safe house also but we have a healing house <laughs> where where women can go and just be sometimes and there's always someone there to make sure you have someone to talk to things like that so so it's it's important to recognize the challenge that you note because uh, it's real but it's also important to recognize that there are uh, resources or people involved in this making it their life's work even that can be sought out and, uh, and uh, alliances can be created to deal with this. Can you clarify what you, you said the, the law is at the heart of the, the problem or at the heart of the solution? Mm -hmm. Given just that the, it's, it's an incredibly complex problem and there are non-legal sort of things being done like just mm -hmm. mentioned. Yeah. What did you mean by that? So even in that stage where women are organizing themselves in community to try to take steps to deal with the challenges that are faced there, you know, my view of law is very broad. It's not just parliament and courts. I think law can be used to operate on the ground in a customary fashion within indigenous communities. And so when women are acting, as Barbara is, uh, is mentioning here, you get the development of new patterns um, maybe they're old, old patterns, uh, but they're you know certainly something that creates incentives. If you abide by a certain way of being in the world, there are certain things that you're able to do in that community. If you don't follow those patterns, those disincentives start to take place again. And so um, sometimes this might sound very moral in a world where law is regarded as being proclaim from on high by just, you know, parliament or a judge says something and that's what makes it so. Um, but if you, if your law is about trying to live a good life, that is the purpose of Ojibwe law, Minopamadazalim, if you're actually trying to internalize the best practices that you identify as a community, and if there's a group of people that are doing that, they are a little site of law there, uh, and they can generate uh, standards for judgment, criteria for decision making, authority, precedent. Uh, they can, in their actions, help to uh, craft uh, um, the, the measures, the things that we would look to in making decisions here and now. And that could be then passed up the line. Maybe a band council would put a band PCR, band council resolution to effect that's a result of what uh, the women are doing, perhaps what we see with the, um, even the national scene will be influenced by all these different customary law groups acting in their own spheres. So I appreciate the opportunity to actually say law 
comes at you from all different directions and we fetishize one way of practicing and working with Va. It's very powerful. I don't want you to undermine it or ignore it, but I also just want us to always be explicit about that's not the only way that law is developed, generated, practiced, implemented. So in, in pulling this course together a little bit <clears throat> on that note, what you could could you say that maybe settler law is limited and, and, and needs to interact with indigenous law in the sense that not only are there is there vocabulary and patterns that are unfamiliar and disadvantage indigenous people, settler law is the only thing, but as a way of guiding people to the good life, settler law is quite limited because it's guided by sort of palm principle work that it's it's not productive in the sense that indigenous law is necessary. That's right. There's something in this course that's not just about indigenous peoples and the law or indigenous law itself. There's something in this course which hopefully will speak to you if you never think about indigenous peoples again, which is here's an aspiration to think about law that tries to have you take it inside yourself in the best way and not have it just be separated and uh, something that you take at arm's length as kind of objective or neutral. Um, the idea here is that um, you can have the best law on the books, um, but you can go to some countries in the world where their laws on the books are better than ours, and life is not as productive, uh, as, as, as whole, um, because there are places in that society, there are sometimes great swaths of that society that aren't internalizing a kind of a sense of um, trying to get along with one another. And I, don't, I think we overstress that, overemphasize that, um, but this, this is hopefully one of the messages of this course. So right now, some of you are taking legal ethics and professionalism, or you have to take that by the time you get out of school, I believe. Um, to what extent are your ethics are your professional responsibilities actually inside you, right? Not just there in some code on a page that you try to twist around and um, you know, treat as a technical, um, manipulative exercise to see whether or not you can you know, skirt the line, right? To what extent is, are those ethics actually who you are and the, and the way you are identified in the world? is in accordance with our kind of code to trying to live a good life. I don't think ethical codes, as important as they are, do that all on their own. You need something of custom. You need something uh, that, that's, a, that's a community uh, that uh, allows that to occur. And again, we don't need to fusion the horizons. We don't need to all see the good life in the same way. Uh, but there is a, some, there's something of that intersectionality then if that way of approaching law is something that you could find, no matter what your field, right? it could be intellectual property, it could be a contract, it could be whatever. I think that quality of life and and how we per um, perceive that can be quite different. Mm -hmm. And so when when we <coughs> talk about um, you know a fair and just society. Um, to me, that means that I don't have to worry if my grandchildren go out that somebody's going to molest them. You know, that, and, and a lot of that has been brought on by um, what a long time ago people learned as a result of the way they were treated in residential school. Mm -hmm. So when we look at things and look at quality of life, for me, it's it's clean water, it's clean earth, it's um, safety, you yes. know, and, and when I'm here, um, it's opened that door legally to look at other yeah. things. So. so this is a good thing to continue to remind ourselves that we're in law school to look at fairness and to look at justice as well as what's the rule and uh, you know what's the case stand for because there's moments that you engage what's the rule, what the case stands for, what does the statute mean, that's a part of your skill. But then you're not just, as we talked about before, you're not just carpenters, you're also architects. And you have to be able to switch between the different uh, 
skills that people will require of you. And one of these is, right now we're gonna have a murdered and missing women inquiry, and you'll probably be invited to participate in that. And some people can participate in that with the chapter and verse, kind of draft out a statute or create a new set of case uh, uh, analyses, but other people can participate in this way um, because as you saw with the residential school and the Indian Act, um, the, the fair and just society ideas need attention as much as the particularities of a, um, a statute. Yes. Mission and how they're wanting to keep um, records of people's um, stories in the National Archives. Yes. And then people are, they say, well, you, you said it was confidential, I want that destroyed. Other people say, I don't mind if it's there. The point is, the, a lot of the reaction was, why are you telling us what to do again right. after such a, you know, a, I guess a positive thing, having this Truth and Reconciliation Commission happen? And I just worry that. Yeah, and I think this is important. Um, the, the comment for those in here is, is worrying about uh, Aboriginal people being told what to do as a result of an inquiry, just as what's happened with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Some Aboriginal peoples are being told that you need to keep silent or you need to allow your records to be um, you know, given sunshine on them. That's a worry you have, and I don't think we should ever not worry. It doesn't mean that our worries just dictate and govern our lives, but we have that power of critical path capacity that we should let that work in us. Um, I don't think uh, that should then paralyze us, but use that worry to craft a, a better response that's there. I belong to a group on Facebook, people who are survivors from residential school, and they brought up that point, and, and I think the important thing with that is to have a choice, you know, and I personally feel that it's really important to hang on to those things, because if you think about the Holocaust and what happened to the Jewish people of, in, in Europe, um, there are naysayers already who say that it didn't happen. And, and so um, are we going to, as Canadians, go down the same road? Um, eventually when I'm gone and I don't, I'm not here to talk about it in class. You know, who's gonna tell my story? And so I feel that it's really important that young people be able to learn from our past. Mm -hmm. And so that point of being able to speak and have it heard, but also then the choice uh, is uh, an element of that as well. Thank you, that was a really good That's, that's one of the challenges we face, right? People have been told to do things that aren't in accordance with their wishes or agency or choice, and if we can create a space for that to operate, that's gonna be resor that's gonna take resources to go back and ask them, and some, some of those people you just can't ask anymore, they've passed on. So let's uh, look at this issue now as it joins its way through the property context. So first of all, a little bit about the Indian Act. Um, you might remember this from prior lectures, but Indian Act uh, land is held by Her Majesty for the use and benefit of the respective bands, respective bands. So Indians actually don't own their land. That's on reserve. Her Majesty owns that land. And Her Majesty, in, in owning that land, crazy, right, um, allows the uh, use and benefit uh, for the Indians. Uh, section 20 here, no Indian is, is lawfully in possession of land in a reserve 
unless with the approval of the minister, possession of the land is then allotted to him by the council of the band. Now this is a little complicated. Some people have what's called certificates of possession that you receive through a band council resolution um, that are recognized by the minister and actually registered in an office in Ottawa. But only about half of the land on reserves actually is held in accordance with a certificate of possession because people still hold their land by custom as well. Just out of curiosity, is there, what would be the cost associated with getting that certificate of possession? And is that in any way prohibitive? Yeah, it doesn't have a, a cost associated with it. Uh, it's just that there's a resistance to bureaucratization and registering things within unit affairs. And then there's just the lack of access to often resources uh, within communities to have this occur. Um, but so, you know, if you, someone comes to you as a lawyer with a property dispute on the reserve, don't think you can solve that by just going to the registry like you could with a uh, you know, fee simple uh, uh, title issue. But it creates complications because you're actually not in lawful possession unless you have this um, certificate of possession. But really, I mean, again, that's why I have a view of law that's not just from Parliament. <laughs> because the, the custom, those are just as lawful, if not more lawful, than what the Her Majesty said to the minister in terms of the way we can hold our land in the community. Um, the minister may issue to an Indian who is in law, who's lawfully in possession of land and reserve a certificate, we call this certificate of possession, as evidence of his right to possession. So that's Possessory interest is called. It's a CP, a certificate of possession. So we've got this case that comes out of the West Bank uh, First Nation in the Okanagan. And here you have um, a man and a woman. Uh, they've been married. Yes, a man and a woman who had been married. And um, they had been issued certificates of possession in both of their names for the house that they were occupying during the course of their marriage. Well, it doesn't go always as planned. They break up. Uh, and in their separation, there's uh, application under the British Columbia Family Relations Act to um, uh, apply to women for a declaration for one half interest in the property of the, it's called the matrimonial home. They're married, both certificates of possession, they break up, and the breakup, the woman seeks a declaration under the provincial Family Relations Act for one, one half interest. And uh, the issue is whether or not the Provincial Family Relations Act can apply to give her that one half interest in the home. And the court comes to the conclusion that she is not entitled under the Family Relations Act to that matrimonial property. She is not entitled under the Family Relations Act to the one half interest in the home because the Indian Act um, has paramountcy in this particular field over the application of provincial law. So the questions the court asks here, is the British Columbia Family Relations Act applicable of its own force? Remember that ex praetorio vigore? Uh, is it applicable of its own force? Um, the court says uh, no. Um, basically, the idea here is that yes, the Family Law Relations Act, in its pith and substance, is, uh, is directed to uh, provincial land. But the essence of what's being uh, covered here is lands reserved for Indians. So the court draws a conclusion on page 803 at the top of the page. 
the right to possession of lands on an Indian reserve is manifestly the very essence of the federal exclusive legislative power under 9124. It follows that provincial legislation cannot apply to the right of possession of Indian reserve lands. Therefore, it would have to be read down. It can't apply, that is the Family Law Relations Act, cannot apply of its own force. Why? Because of its effect. <laughs> it just doesn't square with the dictates that we had talked about earlier. <laughs> In any event, yeah? I, I don't have that one. Okay. The second one, well, if it can't apply of its own force, maybe it's referentially incorporated by Section 88 of the Indian Act. And the court says, no, it can't be incorporated there. First of all, you've got this complication. Remember Section 88 only applies to Indians? The wording doesn't actually apply to lands reserved for Indians. Let me just read it. Section 88 again, it's on page 803 in the middle. Subject to any terms of a treaty or act of parliament, all laws of general application from time to time, in force in any province, are applicable to and in respect of Indians in the province. Not Indians and lands reserved for Indians in the province. So the very wording of Section 88 itself doesn't seem to go that far. Say, general laws of application to and in respect of Indians and lands reserved for Indians. And then secondly, the court says, well, we're actually not even going to have to decide it under that ground that lands reserved for Indians was left out of Section 88, because even if lands reserved for Indians was included, there's a paramountcy issue here in that there would be actual conflict between the federal law and the application of the provincial law through the Family Law Relations Act. Right, so the point is that if the certificate of possession is held in the man's name, um, and then the Family Law Relations Act, the Provincial Law Act, comes along and gives it to the woman, right? There'd just be two different conclusions. Those conclusions can't sit together. It's actual conflict. And then the paramountcy in favor of the federal law would apply here. I'm still confused with the highly complicated, but we run into this. Yes. I would have thought that it didn't matter if it touched like the core of. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's not only that confusion, but now we've got the court saying there's no interjurisdiction immunity right. in some places. And it, that's just that federalism and Indian law is a mess right now. Like even between the cases, Dick and Derrickson, mm -hmm. then you add the whole gloss of, of what the court's doing with interjurisdiction immunity. It, I just don't get it. Well, they did apply a fifth and substance analysis in terms of saying that uh, you know the effect here, uh, sorry, the intent is not to be able to single out. Um, yeah. 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 That's right. They just they just done a different fifth and substance analysis here than they did in the other. Usually in fifth and substance, yes, you think about intent, but you're not just totally taking effect off the board. And Dick, they took effect off the board here. They put it back in. So why do you think they like? There is kind of this, this whole contradiction. Is it, is it something that was just the courts were kind of more concerned with kind of the male concerns about hunting and dick than the kind of like like was it kind of a gender thing? Or okay, what? so so there's well, that's a really good point because look at the um, the interveners here. The interveners in this court are the Attorney General of British Columbia and the Attorney General of Ontario in support of the appellant, the woman. Does does the can Canadian government ever come on side of the Indians? No, except the Attorney General of Canada in support of the respondent. And this one instance where male privilege is actually going to be an issue, I'm not saying this would be an effective federal government. But 
here you finally got the federal government coming on side of the Indians. That's, uh, again, that's not an intent, but certainly the effect is uh, when the government intervenes here, um, it helps to support a gendered uh, way of uh, discriminatorily allocating property by and large. Um, but I want to just take up that question at another level too. Why is this so confusing, this area of federalism? Because I think there's a desire for administrative efficiency in letting the province do as much as they can to regulate Indian lives. And let's not have the federal government involved. Um, and as we talked about last time, there's um, some sense that that's not just administratively efficient, uh, but for some corners, maybe smaller corners, maybe larger corners, it's also a way of assimilating Indians, uh, just allowing it all to be under one set of provincial laws to not have to uh, work out particular regimes. But I think there's a hesitation around that. Like, you know, we, they, there's a recognition. Assimilation is bad. Look at the Indian Act. Look at residential schools. Why should we continue assimilation today? And yet we do. Um, that's what Section 88 is largely about, is helping us manage that. Mary, or sorry, um, yeah, Mary Ellen Turpal uh, critiques the findings in the Derrickson case uh, by saying, first of all, I just want to read some of her words. Um, federalism decontextualized the conflict here. Um, basically, by uh, pitching this as a fight between the federal and uh, provincial law, and who gets to control? Federal government or provincial government? What's not at issue is the very matter of state control itself. Right. By framing this as a division of powers issue, this effectively depoliticizes the cases and silences the questioning of state control over the jurisdiction of Aboriginal peoples. The court, she says, as an emanation of the colonial political regime, is blinded by its role uh, in the political nature of the law that it applies in its context. Now, Mary Ellen went on to become a judge. Uh, she was teaching at Dalhousie at this time, and now she's a uh, special representative for uh, children in the province. She says, let's think about the practical results of this as well, because the last part of the case said, well, it is true that we can't give, under the Family Law Relations Act, a one-half interest in the property, but we can give, the court says, a one-half interest in compensation. So the woman can be given money in lieu of property. But Mary Ellen says that's an empty remedy. Now, first of all, you can't force the sale of that property to be able to generate any compensation. And secondly, the housing market on reserve is just ridiculously terrible. Um, I could go on the reserve and buy a house for like $25,000. And so, you know, with all the compensation order in the world, half of $25,000, $12,000, it's not gonna take very far. It's not a substitute for having the home, right, a place uh, to be able to live there. And also, this uh, order overlooks the cultural significance of indigenous uh, property, right? These are places of distinctive cultural practices, linguistic practices. Right? If a woman can't find a house on the reserve, she's not gonna be able to pass on her language as well. She's not gonna be able to pass on her culture as well. Um, extended families are tightly connected by history, other patterns of behavior. Uh, education of children, right? If you can't get access to a property, often you're off the reserve and your children don't get to participate terrible as sometimes those schools are. They also have many other things that, have, that are going for them in terms of replication of family life. There's no discussion of customary law in this. Um, I'm not sure if the Okanagan people are patrilineal or matrilineal, um, but in, in other instances, say you were with the Haida or with the Six Nations and this kind of order occurred, um, this would just totally be contrary to the uh, 
natural local nature of um, property weapons. And of course, overall, there's not even any discussion of violence in here. One of the reasons indigenous women experience uh, the levels of violence that we saw is that there's no safe places for them often. And they can't have that land held safely in their possession um, without um, some kind of regime. Any questions about the Derrickson case? We've talked about the federalism questions. Any questions about this kind of analysis? Okay, so why not deal with violence against women under Section 35.1 of the Constitution Act? Why don't, why don't indigenous peoples have, have self-governing powers to deal with their safety, to deal with peace in their communities, to deal with ordering in their communities? Well, one might say, well, Section 9127 gives criminal law powers to the federal government. And therefore, Indians can't exercise something that's under 9127. Well, we haven't so far found that just because an issue is given to a province or a federal government under 91 or 92, that doesn't necessarily extinguish the right. The grant of power to a federal or provincial regime doesn't extinguish the right that might be there under Section 35 of the Constitution. But here's the problem. In order to prove that you have governance over this issue, you have to prove it very particularly. Remember, you have to take it to its smallest granulation. So you'd have to, like in the Pomodoro case, you can't just claim the broad right to use uh, and manage reserve lands. That was thrown out by the court. You have to, they had to claim the right to set up high stakes gaming. So here you have to throw out, it's not the right to peace and order and safety. It's not the right to self-government. It's the right to deal with violence in an inter, uh, in, in, in an intimate setting. So what do you have to do? Uh, in the treaty context, you'd have to say, was that in the intention of the parties at the, at the time they signed the treaties that violence against women would be one of the heads of authority that the Indians would exercise? Of course, that's not gonna be in the treaties. People weren't thinking about uh, that. First of all, you have that kind of sexist society in many respects that permitted uh, violence against women in uh, many uh, European and indigenous cultures. Um, uh, secondly, um, remember we're trying to get at what the original meaning was of the treaty at the time it was signed. So under this analysis, you wouldn't be able to say that treaties protect peace, order, safety, dealing with violence against women, unless you took the approach, which was the Winans approach, treaty is a grant of rights from the Indians, not to the Indians. Treaties are a reservation of things not granted. If the Indians didn't give to the Crown the right to be able to deal with issues of violence against women, then it could be that you could still say that remains vested in the community. So there's a way of getting there but that's not necessarily the dominant form of analysis at this moment. Under Section 35.1, in order to show that you have this right, it would have to be integral to your distinctive culture at the, prior to the arrival of European, prior to contact, that you dealt with violence against women. Okay, that's maybe granular enough, small enough, but now think of the evidence you'd have to introduce. So I'm gonna stand in court and spend a year and millions of dollars getting experts to come and talk about all the violence and damage that we did to women. And yes, I'll eventually be able to say, here's the ways that we did with this, dealt with this. Why would I do that? That, that would just be parading and inviting a whole lot of stereotypes uh, for you know, people just to marshal that kind of evidence of, yeah, we were horrible to women. Look how bad it was. And then here's our responses to that. No one's gonna take that step. So it's gonna be virtually impossible in the way Section 35.1 is currently construed to make that claim. And yet, my point would be that it's gotta be integral to any distinctive culture 
to deal with uh, this issue. My broader point, though, is that let's not even use this language of integrity and sustainable culture. Recognizing this is a complex problem that requires different solutions and all sorts of different angles, yes, we need the criminal law. Yes, we need provincial law in all its various forms. But yes, we also need indigenous law on this uh, front. And besides, if we had this power under Section 35.1, we use a treaty power or an African rights power, it would still have to be guaranteed equally to male and female persons. So whenever you exercise rights to self-government as an indigenous community under a treaty or an Aboriginal right, it would always have to take account of the gender equity issues. You could never pass a law under Section 35.1, either a treaty or an Aboriginal right, that was sexist. So, you know, there, there's actually a safety net in place here for allowing uh, a recognition of Aboriginal people's abilities to be able to deal with these issues. Now, there is First Nations lawmaking authority that's currently being exercised under the Family Homes on Reserve and Matrimonial Property Interests Act. That's what came out in 2013. You could watch a little bit about a resource center where First Nations um, often go to to get help in drafting their own laws. If they don't want to draft their own laws, there's federally prescribed rules that can be followed that deal with the Derrickson issue that allow for a division of property on reserve in accordance with either Indian law or in accordance with uh, federal law. If you're interested in learning more about this, uh, Association Calder's giving a talk on this tomorrow at lunch. Oh. And the Indigenous Law Club and Feminist Law Club would be two likely talks. Perfect. Wow. <laughs> okay, so tomorrow, mm -hmm. this is part two of this lecture. 12 Next at 12 30. 158? <laughs> wow. So I'm not going to say much about it because um, we're almost out of time. But the, the legislation has purposes which deal with the kinds of things that the Family Law Relations Act deals in this provincial sphere. It creates exemptions. Um, if, you have, if you're part of the First Nations Land Management Act, or the, your self-governing First Nation, you don't have to follow this act because these acts already facilitate matrimonial property on reserve. You can't have the First Nations Law, First Nations Land Management Act apply to you if you don't have a matrimonial property issue. The provisional federal rules, I, I just don't have time to go through this. The point to make here is um, indigenous peoples can make their own law to um, overcome the Derrickson uh, challenge. And if they don't make their own law to overcome that challenge, federal law steps in and it's now applicable. And uh, both, um, it even applies if there's a non-native spouse married to a native uh, spouse. And I guess Jillian will give us more information about this if you're interested. That's it though, next class we'll come back and we'll deal with the issue of membership and stats.